Welcome to the Albany Book Festival here at the University at Albany. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director. We're really excited to be speaking today with Rosie Perez and Eric Hayes. Rosie's an Oscar-nominated actress, choreographer, filmmaker, advisor to President Obama, social justice activist, and advocate for public health, mental health, and arts education. Eric is a graffiti artist, gallery artist, graphic artist, designer of iconic logos and album covers, streetwear company founder and creator of a brand new look for the Brooklyn Nets. Both have helped to define the urban aesthetic that has become part of our common culture and American heritage. They've brought the rebellion and the innovation that were born in New York City train yards and underground dance clubs into our lives and our consciousness. Their original thinkers and pathfinders, their energy, their brilliance, and their inability to obey the rules have helped to change our ideas of art and beauty. You can find out a lot more about them and their accomplishments here on this page. They also happen to be married. They've been married since 2013. We'll be talking with them about their, how their relationship affects their lives as artists. Rosie Perez and Eric Hayes, it's amazing to be here with you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. Yes, we appreciate you. you. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's okay with, with both of you, before we start the conversation, I'd, I'd like to take a moment to bestow on Rosie our Ironweed Award for her work in film, because this is also part of our, our virtual film festival. So is, is that all right? Absolutely. <laughs> we honor Rosie Perez not only for her achievements in film, but for teaching us what achievement is really for, to lift others up and defend the vulnerable, for using success as a platform for righteous indignation. We honor her not only for shattering stereotypes, but for affirming the truth and the beauty that stereotypes seek to disparage and erase, for being who she is, in an industry that wanted her to tone down the joy and the anger and the volume of her voice for refusing to tame her accent, to adapt to a stale definition of beauty and to smooth out the rough, rough edges of her personality and her art. Now, therefore, on behalf of the university at Albany, one of the most diverse tier one research universities in America with over 50% students of color, representing over 90 nationalities in 100 languages. It gives me great honor to bestow upon Rosie Perez, one of our very first Ironweed Awards for exemplary achievement in film. Wow. <laughs> Thank so, you. <laughs> Thank you. Honor. <laughs> So, so um, now, let, now let's talk. You, if, if you, I just say. <laughs> That's not just say thank you. Go ahead. I'm just yeah. <laughs> overwhelmed here. <laughs> so, let's talk about your marriage. Is, is your marriage an oasis from the pressures of, of work and creativity, or are you frequently bouncing ideas off each other? Um, absolutely. We sort of recognized um, something in each other right away as artists, and you know, of course, we we became friends and soulmates before we got married and sort of uh, entered into this journey together. But um, there's a great, strong sense of recognition um, initially of of sort of our artistic spirit and and how that informed who we were and and you know, how we'd sort of both in our own ways cultivated that flame and kept it burning throughout our lives. And, um, you know, when we, uh, when we made our life one, uh, that all sort of uh, molded into one ball of wax. Yes, yes, we, we certainly put work down and just enjoy our time together with friends and at home. But uh, when, it's, when it's game time, we recognize and support each other. Yeah. Uh, uh, but our, our, our home life 
um, outside of our family and friends coming over uh, is pivotal to both of our success, uh, uh, especially mine. Um, because of all my mental um, health issues, I need a safe haven. I need a supportive partner. I need the world to shut down around me. And, and he offers that to me, you know, and we have a lovely home and, you know, that's all I ever really wanted out of life was that type of security, um, not just on a, a, you know, material level, you know, but on emotional, mental, philosophical level as well. And so it is very, very important to the point where you're not allowed in our house if I'm not okay with it or he's not okay with it. It is our safe haven. It's, it's uh, you know, someone, you know, one of my family members will be like, can I invite so-and-so? I go, no, I don't know them. You know, this is the safe place. You know, let's meet them outside of the house first and see what happens, you know? Um, so it means everything, everything. And, you know, I'd like to add to that, that, you know, I think we're both, we've, we've all, both been sort of loners in our own way yes. and, and self, uh, self-propelled as artists up until the point we met. And I think, you know, we met, uh, I was on the verge of turning 50 and I feel like we both personally and creatively, we met at the right time. We met when we were supposed to meet. We met when we were sort of fully formed, grown up and open to the kind of love and experience that we've shared since the first day. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. And uh, you, you touch on you know, how creativity can be a solitary pursuit, you know, a very individualistic enterprise. Uh, it can require you to be inside your, your head for long periods of time. Is, is, is that hard on a relationship? I wouldn't say so. I think, I think it has to do what um, Eric was referring to about our maturity and the, t- and, and the timing as to where we met in life. Because I think um, if we met when we were both younger, I don't know if it would, would work. <laughs> uh, we would still be like crazy about each other, but you know, it takes friendship and it takes respect to create a real companionship, a real partnership. And especially when you're artists, you know, and when I'm, when I'm working, it's so funny. There was, there's times where the character is living within my head because I am, I'm not on stage yet, or I'm not in front of a camera yet. So the character's inside. And that took him a minute to really understand that that solitude is pivotal for me. And sometimes I would, I would speak my lines just out of the blue and you go, what? I go, nothing. You know, when we first <laughs> got together and I, and then I go, I'm saying my lines. He goes, oh, and I was waiting for him to say, that's weird. Or you should have told me. He just went, oh, okay. You know, and, and also when with him, when he goes to the studio, I remember when we first started dating, he said to me, do you know that you're the first girl that I ever went out with who doesn't bug me all the time when I'm painting? I said, oh, well, yeah, why would I? You're at work. And he goes, wow. I said, because I don't want you bothering me when I'm on the set, you know, or if I'm in the theater. So it, it was just that we clicked in that way without a lot of discussion. That was needed. And it, it's it's what I call um, sort of a push and pull. Um, you know, I think the truth is um, you don't always choose when inspiration's going to hit you or you don't always choose, you know, in, in Rosie's world and business more than mine, you know, it's time to go. It's time to go. You're gone for six months and you're down the rabbit hole. I, I'm sort of, I choose the rabbit hole um, a little more independently, but um, you know, we, we, we each have our moments in terms of the complexity of, of both our creative lives and how it uh, weaves into our home life where, you know, it's game time for Rose. Uh, you know, my, I'm, I'm the trainer. I'm the support system. I'm not, you know, there is there's zero competitiveness in terms of, uh, you know, goals or, or um, anything really. But 
you know, we have, we have developed over 10 years a great instinctual sensitivity for when each other either needs um, the other to sort of step back and give them space or times when, you know, we may need a little uh, feedback or a read or it's the one thing we maintain, um, again, both personally and professionally is a real honest um, a real honest rapport. Um, you know, we, we look to each other for honest criticism as well as honest uh, support when we're, when we're headed in the right direction. We're, we're a, a literary arts organization and normally we, we're, we uh, talk with a lot of writers and, and for some, their, their spouse or their partner is their first reader. And for others, it's not that way at all because partners are, are too close um, to be good objective readers. Um, how, how do you feel about that as, as creative people? Are you a good audience for each other or are you too, too close to each other for that? Well, for me and my work, um, uh, I'm revealing this for the first time. He's my scene partner. <laughs> which, which took a little getting used to. Yes. <laughs> and I remember saying, don't, don't act. Just say the words, just say the words. And, and you know, every night before I go in front on, on, on camera or if I go on stage, he runs lines with me, you know? And the best thing about it, and you know, I said, don't critique me. This is just my rehearsal. This, you know, don't, you know, just say the lines and let me respond. And it, it just, it made a difference in my work and I saw that. I really did see it, you know, and he's very, very honest with my work too, if he likes something or if he wasn't so crazy about something else, you know, and, you know, and like, we're both grown ups, you know, and so we, we do it in a very loving and caring way, the critique of it all. But um, yeah, and I also need him when, especially when I'm away, I need that, you know, that FaceTime, that WhatsApp FaceTime thing, because he also is instrumental in helping me unwind um, because I am not a method actor and sometimes the character is still in me and I need to exercise it out so that I can have a good night's rest and replenish. And I remember one time when I came off a stage <laughs> and I'm talking to him and he goes, he says, you're not on stage. You don't have to keep yelling and projecting. <laughs> and I was like, am I doing that? And he's like, yeah. It's like, oh, okay. So sorry. Well, I think, you know, one of the things to punctuate that is that we didn't necessarily have such a great understanding of each other's medium and process in the very beginning. That was sort of the initial learning curve where, you know, I, I was just a just a, a film a, a movie viewer like everybody else, not a film critic. You know, um, and as I started to learn about choices and uh, tone and and different things that I just was never sensitive to before, um, it's been a a pleasure, sort of understanding the medium and the process and you know the more we understand each other's process the more valuable our criticism can be to each other or yeah. support or criticism yeah and 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 i think it also when you talk about you mostly interview writers what we do is very solitary it's it, it's really important to have a partner that respects that and understands it to an extent because I didn't understand art until in such a deep way until I partnered up with him. Just seeing um, the process, uh, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of work, you know. And you know, even uh, as his wife, and we've been together for years, I will still call him and say, or in the morning say can I stop by the studio? And I remember my sister looking at me like, why you have to ask him permission? <laughs> and I say, because he has to ask me for permission. <laughs> it goes both ways. And it's just out of pure respect because without that solitude, without that, that 
knowing that no one's going to threaten that or no one's going to disrupt that without, you know, uh, a heads up, you, you know, it's, it's so important. It's so important to how, what comes out of you as an artist. I also want to sort of make the point as we're discussing how we're sort of in our own space as artists that we also both develop sort of a, a other side of that coin that creates connectivity for us. Uh, if I could sort of read that for Rose, where being an actor may be a solitary experience for her, everything else she does as an activist and participation in culture and, and movements bigger than any uh, one individual. That's where Rosie's connectivity comes with the world and with communities and with um, other artists or aspiring artists where, you know, I would sort of make a parallel in my world where, yes, I've, I've adopted painting more consistently over the last 10, 15 years as that pure space I can go to in my own head and time. But the other work you described, the, the graphic design, the art direction, the branding, the product, that's where I maintain my connectivity to other, whether be they clients, friends, or uh, movements, if you will. I think we both sort of need and achieve that balance of connectivity outside our front door when it when it fits and, and is important. So you both grew up um, to, to some degree in the same youth culture. You experienced hip hop in its infancy. Um, how, how important is that shared youth culture to your relationship? It's a relief when a certain hip hop song comes on and we both know the lyrics. You know, I dated someone younger and I would say, oh, don't you love that song? I never heard it. Oh, okay. You know, or we, we make a reference about, let's say a TV show from the seventies, eighties, you know, we, we know it like that, you know? And um, so, but also that spirit of, you know, we, well, he specifically was a pioneer in creating this movement. You know, I came along a, a later down the line, but graffiti was the beginning of it all. You know, it wasn't the DJ, it wasn't Cool Herc in the, in the park. He came after that, you know. Um, so it's the rebel that we both have in us that we both understand and click with. Um, you know, as I mean, I used to go to the club six, six nights a week. That's insane. Oh my goodness, I get exhausted just going to a restaurant, you know, pre-COVID. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's, um, you know, I don't know if I answered your question, but it, it, it's comforting to have that that shared experience See. and shared friends. And, and, you know, he'll say, oh, you know, so-and-so. And I go, who's that? Oh, I know who that is, you know, and it's, and it's nice. I, I think it's even a little more magnified for me because I lived in California for over a decade in the nineties. So, you know, I like to, uh, I like to joke that I left New York, traveled around the world and came back to Brooklyn and married the original Brooklyn girl. <laughs> But uh, I think Barbara Streisand would debate that. Our, our generation, <laughs> we're talking hip hop generation. Um, but but in all uh, in all seriousness, um, yes, you know, I, I I came very close to getting settled in California in my forties and the nineties. But there was always a little voice in the back of my head saying. In-laws in the valley is not you. That's not where the road ends. You've, you've got to turn the I always knew during my time in Los Angeles that eventually I would turn the boat around and sail back home. Um, so uh, finding, finding Rosie and finding this kind of love and happiness uh, was proof positive that I made the right choice coming back to New York. And the person that introduced us is a mutual friend of us, ours, and it's the uh, very well world renowned artist, Lee Kionis. Who's, uh, who's been a who's been one of my best friends and partners in uh, art and uh, 
car racing since we were 18 years old. And, and uh, I was emceeing his 50th birthday party when uh, I introduced Rose to come up oh, and gosh, speak and the rest the is story. history. The rest okay, is history. Okay. The rest is history. <laughs> <an> embarrassing <laughs> we, 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 uh, we, we screened um, Wild Style with Lady Pink um, and it was, it was the first time she had seen the film in, in something like 20 years, she said. So um, it was, yeah, we, we, uh, we know Lee and, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful culture and just a wonderful uh, kind of milieu, yeah. Those are the uh, two sides of the coin, Wild Style and Style Wars. Wild Style being the fictionalized version and Style Wars being the documentary. So. Which, which, you, which you start in, Style Wars, yeah. Which I, I, can on, I can only view like once every 10 years myself, to your point. <laughs> So um, in, in, in a terrible age of, of identity politics and, and polarization, can, can hip hop or, or, or youth culture in general um, help, us, help us bridge our, our differences? It can. I think that if, it's, if there is an, an organization created around it, um, I think that a lot of the movements of today are very, very important, you know, and I think that they're learning and they're growing. Um, but I think that it can, I, I always believe that music and art could bring the world together, but I think that music and art has to get together first and understand what are we asking? What are we fighting for? Um, you know, you know, have a concrete agenda and platform and specific ask because when you don't, it just gets lost in ideology. Um, but I truly do believe that if those two mediums came together, um, it could be very, very effective just, just as it was effective uh, during the AIDS movement, during the AIDS protest, you know, you had um, the gay men health crisis having the dance -a where they brought music and big music artists, you know, R&B artists, hip hop artists, um, dance music artists together to raise money. Um, and, you know, a lot of creativity spun out of that in the, in, in, in the spirit of protest, in the in spirit, but see, just as that, when you look at organizations like ACT UP or the GMHC, which came from ACT UP and so on and so forth, they had a specific agenda. You know, they had specific asks and they got stuff done. And I think that with identity politics right now, people get so stuck in, I'm right, you're wrong. Um, and if you're going to get stuck in that, you have to say, here's why, and here's how we can come together and how we can fix it. You know, there was a simple act in the beginning of the AIDS crisis was to have Ronald Reagan just say the word AIDS. He could not say it. He could not bring himself to say it. That was a huge, huge uh, victory, you know, and, and also just to have it be um, viewed as not a gay disease. That was a huge, another huge victory, but it took time, it took effort, it took organization, it took so much, so much. And I think, I don't wanna sound like the old person in the room, um, but I think that work, work ethic um, is, is not as prominent these days. And it's it's un, it's 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 not it's it's unfortunate because everyone is afraid of being canceled, you know. Even if coming together around COVID and the deaths of COVID, you know, I remember with the the, the numerous deaths coming from AIDS. It's like, why don't we make a quilt? You know, have all the people who died. And it was a thing that brought the nation together of 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 grieving and then trying to heal from the loss of lives, you know, and, and we didn't have that until, you know, Biden went into office, um, you know, and I, and, and still, I don't think it's enough, you know, there's so many things that we can do to bring everybody together. See, that's a, that is a very sort of high level educated activist take on it, um, on how to be proactive and get results. Um, I'll give you a sort of 
maybe more naive broad stroke answer, which is that I always believed hip hop was an equal opportunity employer that, um, you know, there are a lot of, there have been stereotypes, uh, be they color or class or e economics of who a graffiti artist, who, who people think a graffiti artist is, who people think a uh, rap musician is. And, and, you know, they're so steeped in stereotypes from the outside. From the inside, it's not so much that way. Um, you know, and I always thought graffiti was such a great example because, um, put it this way, there is no single history of graffiti. There is, um, where, when you were born, where you were born, what your relationship to hip hop is something you choose. Hip hop doesn't choose it for you. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're in Bangkok and you're inspired to write graffiti, there is a graffiti movement in Bangkok. There is one in Iceland. There's one in Singapore. There's one in, you know, Beijing. So um, to me, the beauty of hip hop culture and, uh, especially how it's translated in fashion and product is that um, it, it became the language of a generation that everybody embraced in their own image. So you go to Japan, hip hop has a different flavor. You go to Germany, hip hop has a different flavor because after a period of them embracing it as a sort of import culture <laughs> that we invented, um, everybody went about the business of, of reshaping their cultures in a hip hop generation in a way that's uh, authentic and autonomous to ev like, you can't challenge anybody's authenticity in hip hop. If they believe it, that's, you know, if they're, if they're, you could challenge somebody's authenticity okay. in hip hop. <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> e everything, everything can be challenged, but um, you know, I think it starts with the belief that if you want to participate, you can. Yeah. It's not, it's, you know, that the, all these misconceptions about um, sort of entrance passes are, 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 uh, are foreign. The entrance pass is just wanting to join the party and, you know, if you have something to contribute or say, all the better. Yeah. And I think a good example when you're talking about terms of political power or um, uh, having your voice have a lot of power and a lot of uh, being very relevant, um, I, I saw that with, believe it or not, K-pop. They understand how to, to capture the world's attention. I thought it was so fascinating what they did during the... Trump administration of shutting down his rally. You know, I was like, that is so much power. Oh my goodness. It's, and, and, and the thing is, is that hip hop is number one out with, well, in country music, but you know, it, it's, it still has a lot of power throughout the world. So much power. And when I saw that, I remember telling uh, the young activist friends of, of, of mine, I said, you sit here on Zoom day after day, complaining about whatever you want to complain about in, in regards to politics, but all we're doing is talking. Nobody's acting and you, and just a tweet is not enough. You know, we need big ideas. We need a big way to move the needle forward. And I, for me, I was like, wow, K-pop, they, genius. It's genius, and it's just a whole bunch of young guys, you know. And and uh, but everybody was watching, everybody was listening, and made worldwide news. That's power. Which is, uh, in a large part, understanding the new power of the internet and communications. I mean, when when I set out to build a brand, there was no internet. We would, I would go to Singapore and make a presentation, hoping to sort of. Uh, engage people to join, you know, what we considered a, a new movement at the time. So the, the rules of engagement have, have changed so radically in the last 10 years. So, um, you know, despite our age or generation, we've been uh, pretty proactive in um, 
staying up to speed, uh, if not literally in the technology, in terms of how the technology um, not only affects us, but, um, you know, how it, how it increasingly, the more you understand it as a tool, the more powerful it becomes uh, in any message you want to transmit. Should kids be outlaws? How, how important is it for young people to rebel and break the rules? I, no, I'm, I'm a big believer in breaking the rules, but I'm also a big believer in um, understanding that you are so that if you get caught breaking the rules, you don't really have any uh, grounds on which to complain. It's, it's a, it's a uh, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword kind of world out that way. You know, it's funny you said that because when I saw Jane Fonda getting arrested recently protesting climate change, there was no melodrama, you know, associated with it. She knew exactly why she was there. She knew exactly that she was going to get arrested. She held up her cuffs. She didn't resist. She didn't cry. She's like that to me, I was like, you know, I called my young activist friends. I go, you see, that made worldwide news. You want to know why? Because they said she purposely did that. She knew how to follow the rules and the forces that be that she was confronting couldn't do anything except put a zip tie on her hands. That's it. That's it. So they listened to her. What she had to say was heard, you know? Um, and, and, you know, I got, I, you know, they clapped back and said, well, no, nah, nah. I said, no, you got, hey, Hey, you guys told me about her. I looked, I, I said, I, I, I looked at that and I was like, I wonder if they watched that. And you did. So that, that's the point. That's the point. So I do, I've been arrested for my protests once. Um, I was scared to death, <laughs> you know, but we all, it was, it was all well planned. And, and, and I knew the consequences and I was ready for the consequences. That's what I mean. And we didn't hurt anybody. We didn't, we didn't destroy anybody's livelihood. Um, you know, what we did is that we got the world's attention. And that's, that's the point. If you're going to break the law and if you're going to break the rules, make sure it's worth it. It's not, it's not, it, it, because here's the thing, the fight has nothing to do with you. It's not personal, right? So even when I got arrested and I was scared and the, and the cameras were on me, I wanted to burst into tears and I held it back because then it would have been about me and not about the cause. You know, if I resisted, it would have been about me again and not about the cause. And so, you know, but the thing is, is that I had a lot of mentors. I had everyone teaching me all these things of how to become an activist, you know, just sitting down with the late, great Julian Sands and, and, and uh, this wonderful woman, Lori Fabiano, who spearheaded the GMHC back then when I volunteered there. Um, Dennis De Leon, who was the uh, secretary lawyer uh, um, in New York and, um, legal counsel of New York and, and he took me under, he's the one that um, put me on the list for the Obama things. And, you know, he sat me down, he said, listen, you're not on the street anymore. You're not a foot soldier anymore. Now you're on the inside and you have to act accordingly. And I was like, excuse me? He says, yes, because if I'm sticking my neck out for you, you have to act accordingly because we need to get stuff done. I said, okay, and you I know, and so it's, it's that for me, you know what I mean? And I've been the benefit, the, the third hand beneficiary of all that knowledge and experience over the last 10 years. Because, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I wasn't a very political animal for the first 50 years of my life. And uh, as I sort of witnessed and applauded Rosie's uh, continued activism, it, it it engaged me intellectually and emotionally first. And uh, it was a few years into our marriage where I had my first call to duty in, uh, in a local board meeting over uh, some zoning I wasn't happy about. And, uh, you know, I, Rosie gave me a crash course in sort of these things she's discussing of how to, you know, how to understand 
you know, to go from being, uh, I was initially the yeller in a, in a, in a uh, town hall in front of a hundred people. And, you know, I, I, I was sort of schooled by one of the more sophisticated members saying, Hey, you know what? Um, you're a yeller. We need, we need, you know, there are people who are quiet behind the scenes and they're yellers. So you're a yeller. Um, that's okay. But it gave me a sense of uh, awareness about it that I hadn't had before to understand when the times to sort of raise up and raise your voice are and and that there are also times to just sort of uh, be in the back of the room and understand what's going on before you uh, make any movement or comments so yeah. this but I, I i encourage all young people at albany state if they're listening if if you see social injustice speak up speak up but before you speak know what you want to say and make sure you have the plan that follows what you want to say, you know? Um, but I, I totally, you know, even in my career in, in Hollywood, you know, I was like, oh, this place is racist. And everybody, shh, what do you mean shush? Don't shush me. Why aren't you stating it as well? You know, and sticking your neck out leads to certain consequences, you know, and I was okay with that. I was okay with all the criticism that I received. You know, I was already a veteran in that war of activism, you know, with the AIDS movement. And people would say, oh my God, I know you're so hurt. I go, no, I'm not. I'm angry. I'm not hurt. I'm not hurt. This, it has nothing to do with me. This is the, I'm talking about the bigger picture. You know, because if I'm not here in Hollywood, the, the problem still exists. So while I'm here, you know, I'm gonna pick up the blow horn because at that time, that was my role. My role was the yeller. My role was waving the flag, like, excuse me, this is wrong, you know? And, and, and you know, and the most, most hurtful part, I will say what did hurt me, no, it didn't hurt me, annoyed me, um, was my own pe people in the sense I didn't know them, but they were also Latinos. Latinx, whatever, they were the biggest, biggest voice telling me to be quiet because they were afraid of rocking the boat. And I was like, rocking the boat, I'm jumping, I'm jumping ship. What do you mean rocking the boat? I don't want to be in this boat. You know, I want to be in that boat that everybody else is in. <laughs> you, know? you know, that's what I'm talking about, you know? And so, yeah, state your case, because if not, then you have no room to complain. So we're always encouraging students to try to make the world a better place here at New Albany. Um, but, but at the same time, students come here to fulfill the American dream. You know, about 30% are the first in their families to attend college. 40% receive federal Pell Grants for exceptional need. Is there, is there a contradiction between doing good and trying to get your foot in the door of the capitalist economy? No. 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 As an American, that is your right to make money. It's Get that money. It, if you put in the work and you have the talent to back it up, you deserve that seat at the table. And you better pick up that, that golden fork and eat well, because that is your right. If you put in the work, and you have the talent to back it up and the skills and, and the tenacity and the work ethic. It is your right to live well. You know, that is the American dream. And it doesn't mean that you're a hypocrite. You don't need to be poor in order to be an activist. That, that, is, that is, you know, whoever made up that way of thinking, I don't know what the issue was. You know what I mean? Because if you think about all the hippies that protest the Vietnam War and peace, love, anti-establishment, they're the ones that went on to be the people in the clubs in the 80s snorting coke and, and, and wearing furs on the dance floor. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's so hypocritical. If, 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 a, if, a, if, a, if a rich life is what you want, get it. Because there are great millionaires and billionaires out there that do great work. 
in regards to making this world a better place for everyone and leveling the, the, the playing field. Because if you are a true activist and a true artist at, in, this, in the same vein or, or accountant or whatever, you will give back. You know, you will, that's part of activism too. You gotta put money in the pot in order for things to happen. You know, um, it, 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 it takes, well, not, not so much now because of the internet, but still it takes money for a movement to exist. You know, so yeah, get that money. Well, I, I, look, I also think there's a, there's a uh, subtle question hidden behind that, which is that, um, you know, it's on, uh, it's on each of us individually to stay true to um, our authentic self. I mean, that's the challenge. Um, you know, we all embrace success. We all embrace the, the, the uh, trappings of a better life if we've done the work to earn it. But, uh, you know, it goes without saying there are, um, there are fast tracks to success that, you um, uh, may in, in obvious or less obvious ways compromise some integrity along the way that um, you might find yourself with a better life, but not entirely happy with how you got there. I think uh, both of us uh, in terms of who we are at the core um, have always uh, taken care to proceed with our careers and any measure of so-called success along um, the lines of our of our personal belief system. Um, you may have touched on our, you know, our sort of uh, youthful radicalism and, and um, what have you, but uh, it's um, it's the thing um, I think that we really take to bed with us at night as humans and as artists that um, you know we, we've we've. You know, we've had our we've had our learning curves over many many decades, but um, none of them at the expense of who we are. Right, we can wake up and still look ourselves in the mirror. And there, there is and no, we're, and we're okay with all of our decisions because we moved. We both moved with integrity, and you know. But you know, if you if you want to be poor and suffer for for the cause, hey, whatever cream should drink it. I'd rather not. You know. I, that's 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 just me because I I come from abject poverty and I don't romanticize abject poverty for one minute of my life. It is hard. It is horrible, and I I never want to be poor again. And people would say, "Oh, that's messed up." No, it's not. No, it's not. I worked hard my whole life so that I can break that cycle, and I did. You know, you should be commending me and others who have done the same. We're not sellouts. Sellouts is when I compromise my integrity. I, I, I haven't, you know? And so there's no shame in that. There's no, there's, you know, that, that's a victory, you know? But I don't romanticize the ghetto. I don't romanticize poverty at all. And it really bothers me when certain individuals do because I, I say you're doing others, people that are coming behind you, a great disservice, you know, because that's, it's, it's not real. It's not real. And it holds people back. See, I think, I think my generation and community suffered a little more from a sense of um, commercialism being a compromise and a sellout um, where we, where I was initially on sort of a gallery playing field. Um, one of the reasons I chose uh, graphic design and, and more commercial endeavors was it was um, uh, sort of a very honest exchange. It was, uh, you know, a, a fixed target that you could hit in a concrete successful manner and then reap the rewards of that hard work in a very finite sense. Um, so, you know, it took our generation of graffiti artists to, sort of to, to, to cross this bridge from being uh, radical populists who put out our message for free in this urban distribution network to have to come to terms with the fact that, all right, now it's uh, now coming above ground in the real world. We have to 
create our own distribution networks and create um, a value system that was entirely different than um, sort of the lack of value system we grew up in in, in, a, in, a, free, in a creative free-for-all. <laughs> New York City is, is a big part of uh, your shared culture and it's uh, a magnet for so many of our students. Some, some, some folks feel like they're temporarily in exile and they, they just can't wait to get back to the, to the city. What's so great about the city and what's gonna happen to it? Um, you know, in the age of, uh, you know, COVID and telecommuting and, you know, people, you know, fleeing to, to the, uh, the suburbs and the hinterlands. And un, uh, unbridled gentrification, which has changed the face of this metropolis um, in the last 10, 15 years to be almost unrecognizable, really. Um, you know, we both, uh, I, I can, I sort of identify as a New Yorker as strongly as I identify anything. Um, and you know, I discussed how I knew I knew the pull of coming back home to New York was always there when I left. Um, but probably most importantly, New York has found its way into into the lexicon of my work over the last five years, um, having gone from sort of uh, mainly abstraction to something much more figurative. Um, that all started with the landscape, the urban landscape of New York just capturing my imagination in a new way about five years ago. And, uh, you know, a lot of my sort of personal work is uh, uh, a testimony to what I call vanishing New York, trying to capture these, these uh, not just the visuals, but the essence, the memory, the sort of dreamscape that New York always was in my head. Um, I feel like it's a vanish. It is to some degree a vanishing city, and I'm sort of working hard as a painter to 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 bottle some of it before it's gone. Yeah, I agree and and, and disagree in just a little bit because I never I never viewed myself as a New Yorker until um, Hollywood kept saying it. Um, because when you come from the boroughs, you're a borough person. You're, I was from Brooklyn. I wasn't from the city. I wasn't from Manhattan. I wasn't from New York City. I was from Brooklyn. And it had a specific identity to that. And with the gentrification, that identity started to morph in a very like, heartbreaking way. And I remember the gentrifiers would say to me, you know, because I, you have to make friends with them, at least some of them. And, uh, you know, they're like, well, New York City is always changing. I go, let me make a correction to you. The city was always changing. The boroughs never changed. If they did, it was, it, it would move like a snail, you know? And, but when the nineties hit, it just, the change came rapidly. And, and, it's, and it's really bizarre to me. And if you look at real estate right now, during COVID, the uh, market value for real estate in New York City, in Manhattan, has decreased. Where Brooklyn, it has increased. And I'm going, oh, great, even more people are going to come here. You know, and, <laughs> but um, I think that the allure to the city is because... It's iconic. It's been romanticized so beautifully in literature and in film and, and everybody wants to come here to be who they want to be, not necessarily who they are. You know, it's the great city of reinvention for a lot of people and you can escape and do your own thing. You know, that escapism is, is a bit less available. Um, because of gentrification and because of globalization and the, the build of the overbuilding of New York City. You know, when we were younger, um, the things that we were allowed to do pre Giuliani was fantastic. I mean, my gosh, you know, of course everybody, me as a Brooklyn girl, when I saw um, Saturday Night Fever, it changed my life. I remember sitting in the, in the movie theater, I was a little girl and I was going, I could cross the bridge. She, 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 she 
first time she imagined she could actually cross the bridge to on Manhattan. my own, you know, <laughs> not just on Easter to see the Easter parade or to see the Rockettes whenever we could afford it. You know, it, that's the only time that I really went to the city as a young girl. And when I saw John Travolta having the same thing of go to Manhattan, what do you mean? There's no reason to go to Manhattan. I have everything here in Brooklyn. And so I get the allure because I, I was one of those people. I wanted to go to the city all the time after I saw that movie. And the nerd that I was, where did I go to the Museum of Natural History? How pathetic is that? You know, but for me, I, it was just like, I'm taking myself to the Museum of Natural History. And at first I didn't know if I could afford it. Another funny thing is that I wanted to go, Raul Julia came around, you know, there's very few representations of, of of Latinos on film or on stage. And he was a God, God rest his soul, he is a God to me. And I wanted to go see him so badly. He was going to be in Shakespeare in the park. And I was such a borough chick that I, I was like, I can never go to Shakespeare in the park. And you know, and my cousin, let's go, let's sneak in. I go, I know, cause we'll never be able to afford a ticket. I never realized it was for free. So we snuck in, got all these cuts and bruises by climbing trees and going over <laughs> to look over, it's just, you know, seeing the rats at night going. To, it was, and then we went back to Brooklyn and bragged about it. Yeah, we snuck into Shakespeare in the park. They go, it's free. I'm like, what? what? You know, so I get it. I totally get it. And I think that with all the massive changes to New York, I think that the myth or truth or somewhere in between of New York will never go away. I think would the you, law will be the law to New York and the iconic status of New York will always remain. So would you, would you encourage young people to go there or would you Absolutely. caution them? Yeah. yeah, you would. See, the, the irony is I have almost the opposite experience as a Manhattan kid. Um, who was sort of spoiled, spoiled for choice as a kid. Um, I had a, had a, had a uh, profound curiosity and um, sense of downward mobility, I would call it, because I would cut school in Manhattan and go ride the trains to the end of the line in Brooklyn, <laughs> the end of the line in the Bronx. I wanted to know what was going in the, in the, in the real grimy corners of the, of the inner city. Um, but uh, yeah, I remember one time he told me, "Oh, we used to take the the ride the trains so that we could go to the graveyard, the the you know where where the trains park, or all the way out in East New York." I go, "Why did you want to go to East New York? Nobody wants to go to East New York. People who live in East New York don't want to be in East New York, you know. And, and especially back in the seventies, are you kidding me? And, and, and he and loved it. Cr crazy wild me would put on my fatigues and my hardest little look and uh, walk through Mike Tyson's East New York in nineteen seventy four, which uh, didn't phase me then, but sounds pretty crazy now. It, it is crazy. <laughs> it was crazy then and crazy. But now. but we we. Uh, we're survivors. We're New York survivors. I, I think we've seen pretty much everything. Yeah. But I think if young people want to go to New York to explore who they really want to be or find out who they really are, I think that they should. But I think that they should proceed with caution because you know what? New York can eat you up and spit you out in a heartbeat. You but, know, it is not easy. It's it's so expensive to live here. There's so many people who, you know, won't have your back and take advantage of you. And you really, really should be careful. But, you know, if you have that rebel spirit in you, go ahead and do it. And, you know, just to punctuate it again, I felt like, especially in my younger life, that I was almost jealous of everybody coming from out of town. I, I've sort of been, close friends with and front row seats to Keith Herring arriving in New York the way Andy Warhol had before him. And there was always a very clear sort of split between um, the opposing advantages where we native New Yorkers, we knew the lay of the land, we had all these roots and, and sort of uh, New York cred. Um, but at the same time, uh, we were always trying to outrun our past in some way that we couldn't put our finger on where, um, you know, everybody else had the, these, you know, the, the otherness 
reports of people coming from the Midwest or West Coast and just shedding their skin, becoming a whole new person. And, and as Rosie said, coming to New York to be who they wanted to be, not who they were born to be, where in some way, even to this point in this conversation about New York, we are, we are uh, uh, for better and worse, under that umbrella for life. Right. So I'd like to ask you a million things, but um, I'm going to I'm going to end with with one question, which is uh, what what's the most important thing that you've learned from each other? I can tell you it's uh, humility and grace under pressure. That's what I've learned from Rose, among other things, a million other things. From him. A stronger work ethic. I thought I had a strong work ethic, but this man, oh my goodness, he's, he inspires me in that way so much. But also love always saves the day. Love and respect, it just goes hand in hand. And at the end of the day, when you know, you're know you at the end of your life, you're not going to be like, oh, can I have that movie here in the bed with me? Or can I have that painting in the hair in the bed with me? I want this guy right next to me. You know, and that's what it means. That's what life is all about. It's a cliche, but, you know, uh, it all means nothing without someone to share it with and uh, having. That's from mahogany. That's from the mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it means it, nothing it, without someone to share it with. You know, I think uh, I think I can speak no, for success both. Success means nothing without someone to love. I can speak for both of us when I say I think we were fairly happy and con we thought we were happy and content in our lives until we met and then we realized how much more there was. We've been talking with Rosie Perez and Eric Hayes, two very fine people. Rosie and Eric, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Absolutely a pleasure. We enjoyed this tremendously. And I feel so, so humbled and honored by the award. I wanna thank you so, so very much. It's, it's huge, so thank you. To our online audience, please visit albanyfilmfestival.org for a wide range of interviews, workshops, and events. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be well, be safe.